that Mark was going around to all these places giving this interesting talk about uh, social media and public health stuff, and he hasn't actually given a talk about it here in CLSP, uh, at least not recently. So I asked him to come and uh, talk about it here. So, okay, Mark. As a great made-up story that explains this talk. <laughs> um, so the reason I decided to talk about this and not something else is that um, many of you have heard about the something else I do uh, because I tend to talk about it a lot or my students will talk about it. So I decided to talk about things that you guys probably haven't heard about because, um, well, uh, you haven't. I don't know why. You just haven't. Unless you were following me around when I was giving this talk. Um, so, uh, so that's caveat number one, so it's a little bit different in terms of, uh, we don't normally talk about this stuff here. The other thing is this talk isn't for a CFs or NLP crowd. This was a talk that I um, wrote for a public health department um, or school or what have you. <coughs> so it's a little bit light on technical details, but the uh, point of it is to kind of show the diversity of things we can do and some examples of things we can do. So I still think it will be interesting for people here. I think you guys will get the uh, public health goals. If you don't, you can ask. Uh, and if you want to ask more details about some of the technical stuff, that's fine, and I'll try and add it as I go. Um, okay, great. Let's get started. So opportunities in social media data for public health. Uh, the word social media on this slide is going to be taken very, very broadly to include lots of things. Uh, and then later on, I'll say social media to just talk about one uh, specific type of data. All right, so let's talk about public health. Um, so public health, for those of you who don't know, is the prevention of disease, prolonging of life, and promotion of health. And you might say, that sounds a lot like what my physician does anyway, uh, or at least I hope they're doing that when I go to see them. So what exactly is public health? And basically, the way to think about it is individual health is a one doctor, one patient. Public health is a million patients. Somewhere between one and a million, we draw the line between individual and public health. And I don't know where that line is drawn, so you can figure it out, and yeah, there's room for debate about that. So that's public health. So what are the sorts of things that public health does? Um, so disease surveillance, which means um, how many people roughly are sick, or like, what diseases do people have? Uh, Self-medicating behavior, so what medications are people taking by themselves, not seeing the physician? Uh, vaccinations, you also have gotten the flu shot this year. It's free, it's over there, Clipper Hall, Clipper uh, Room. Uh, education, so educating people about uh, health use, tobacco use, which we uh, don't support, it comes to the uh, red X. And drug use, and I mean here both uh, prescription drugs or illicit drugs, uh, a whole host of things. Okay. So uh, if you ever take a class on public health, which we actually do offer in the CS department here, uh, it's a short course in the spring, uh, you'll learn that there's a nine or 10 step cycle to the public health ecosystem or whatever. If you walk around the halls of Bloomberg, you'll actually see posters. So I've simplified it to a two step process, okay? So the two steps involve a population that we, that we want to make healthy or keep healthy. And the second part is doctors or people who are work with doctors, like public health officials don't necessarily have to have MDs. Okay, that's the second group. So the two steps of the cycle are surveillance, where the doctors want to learn something about the population. Um, and the second step is intervention, where the doctors, based on what they've learned about the population, do something to make the population healthier. Okay? This is a cycle because we're not done. The doctors then see, well, did, what we, uh, did, did our policy work? Did it make people healthier? If so, great. If not, what can we do to refine it? So let me just give you a very simple example. Seatbelts. So seatbelts are one of the greatest public health inventions in the past 50, 60 years. Seatbelts have saved numerous, numerous lives. Everyone here hopefully uses a seatbelt, and that's because there are public health officials that have for decades been pushing that agenda, right? So what we did was we saw lots of people were dying in car accidents. We came up with seatbelts, that was the surveillance part, we came up with seatbelts that improved the health of the population, and then we did things like said, okay, well not everyone's wearing them, so let's pass state laws, or let's come up with airbags, and there's been pushes over the years to keep innovating on uh, uh, car safety. Right? And cars today are incredibly safe compared to where they were uh, many years ago. Uh, deaths uh, and injuries from car accidents have dropped uh, by staggering up. Okay. All right, so uh, public health is, as I said, improving the health and quality of life in the population. So uh, where I come in is this requires data. We need to know something about the population if we're going to do surveillance of the population. Otherwise, we're just guessing. Okay, so the normal way people get data about the population 
is they either do surveys or clinical visits. So when you go to the doctor, the doctor talks to you, someone might call the doctor and say, how many of your patients have asthma, or how many patients have this disease, or are patients taking these drugs, right? That's one way we get information. The other way is surveys. Right? I don't know if anyone here, you can raise your hand, if you participated in some kind of health survey where someone called you. I actually participated in one a couple years ago. But basically, people call you up and ask you questions about health, and you try and give them honest feedback. There are many, many, many surveys like this. The largest one, uh, or one of the largest ones, is run by the CDC that calls um, uh, about 350,000 people on a yearly basis in the US. It's actually run by the states on behalf of the CDC, but whatever. Um, so that's where we normally get data from. The problem is this is really limited the sort of research that we can do because there are many sorts of things that we cannot get from, um, clinical, uh, from looking at clinical visits or surveys. Right? So outcomes or incomes, uh, social media. And this slide is a little bit old. It was made like last week, so there's a couple new companies that probably aren't on here that should be. Um, and some that have been acquired by Facebook, no doubt. Um, and social media is a really interesting data source for a number of things. So people look at it for politics, sports, entertainment, uh, people talk about work, people talk about what they eat for breakfast. But what we care about here is that people talk about health, right? And so what we want to know is how social media can be part of this uh, public health conversation. Um, the basic idea is, uh, of why this is even relevant at all is that social media reflects everyone's ongoing life, right? So what do you type, or you know, what, do you, uh, what do you tweet, what do you put on Facebook, right? You kind of uh, talk about what's going on in general in your life. And for most people, health is an important part of what's going on in their life. It might not be the major focus of what they talk about, but they often throw out a lot of comments that are very informative about their health, right? So if we mine social media data, we can learn something about health, right? And so the idea here is that there's both an opportunity for surveillance to learn information about a population, but there's also room for intervention, right? So let me give you some examples of what I mean, right? So surveillance, what we want to do is do, uh, take existing things that we survey and do them better, faster, cheaper, right? So how can social media allow us to do better, a, a better job of things that we're already doing? But the really exciting part are new opportunities, things that we cannot do with existing data resources that we now can do with social media data, and I'll give examples of both. Um, what I won't talk about, but it's very important, is intervention, where people look at how we can use social media to actually implement policies. And there's a lot of exciting work going on in, in the field of psychology, um, uh, disease surveillance, vaccinations, uh, uh, food poisoning, all that are based around this idea that social media is a tool for communicating with the population uh, about various public health aspects. Um, so I'll just be talking about surveillance, which is where the work we've done is focused on. Okay. So that was a very broad uh, use of social media, right? If you looked at the images I put up, it was lots of different sources of data, right? But I want to talk about three specific categories of data. The first one is search logs. The second one is social media, where now I actually mean things like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google+. Has anyone heard of Google+. I don't know. Okay. It's another, it's, it's a relatively new uh, uh, product. Um, and web forums. So uh, search logs are going to be really good for course trends, which is sometimes all we really need, so looking at general trends in the population. Uh, social media is really good for shallow content analysis, and we talk a lot about that here in the context of NLP. And web forums are going to be really good for doing deep dives on very specific questions. And we'll give examples. There's a three-part talk. We haven't started it yet, but the three parts are going to be each one of these. All right, any questions before I go on to search logs? Yes. <laughs> Say your name before you. So my name is uh, Miles. Hi, Miles. <laughs> so why do you think that? So when you say search log type of course. Oh, okay. Do you, do you mean the published stuff? Yeah, the stuff I get. Uh, Michael's done work where he has search logs that I think he keeps locked up in his apartment uh, that he can't share with anyone. That you can actually do some really fantastic, much deeper uh, sorts of stuff, even deeper than the sorts of things we can do on Twitter. Because you 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 have these sessions and you can look at behavior over time. It's really fantastic stuff. So I just mean the sort of stuff that normal mortals can do with the data available to us. And if you so happen to work for a company that runs a major search engine like A9. Anyone know A9? Okay, two people. <laughs> wow, okay. It's Amazon's search engine. They have one. Um, uh, then you can do some uh, much cooler stuff. Okay. Now one's Googling A9. Okay. Nine, not spelled out, just the numeral nine. Okay, search logs. 
So let me tell you an example of, we actually have a number of projects going on using search logs. Um, one question that we want to answer. So the question is very simple. What is the impact of the economy on the public housing population, right? on the overall household population? So we think that economic trends are going to have an impact on the health of a population. Specifically, during a recession, right, this might lead to people being more stressed and more physical pain. There might be a lot of negative health outcomes just by there being a, a recession. Right? And specifically, we happen to have had a fairly major recession in the United States recently that we can look at to try and answer some of these questions. Uh, of course, getting data for this is incredibly hard. We need a lot of, uh, we need a large population to try and answer this. Uh, we have a long time span, so we want to look at before and after the recession, before and during the recession. Um, that's a lot, a long period of time, perhaps. Uh, and we don't really know what we're looking for. So there's many, many things that we want to investigate in terms of health impact, um, and it's hard to come up with a survey that asks all these things. So instead, we're going to use Google Trends, which is the mortal solution to uh, search queries. So um, for those of you who um, are familiar with Google Trends or not, it's, it's, it's a service where basically you type in queries uh, and Google will give you plots over time about how many people search this query. Assuming the query is relatively popular, you can all Google your names to see if there's a trend for your name. Uh, probably not. Um, uh, and uh, they also give you information about location and things like that. Right? Um, so it actually is a very cool service to try and visualize data. Um, don't go run off and use it because it's actually really hard to get data and to merge it together and to normalize things correctly. But if you're interested in this, you can talk to me I'll say how we do it. So what we did is we found uh, 343 queries uh, from Google Trends um, that were health-related. We looked at um, increases in these trends during the Great Recession, and we selected the 100 <laughs> that showed the greatest increase. And we identified the Great Recession as being roughly December 2008 to the end of 2011, which is where our data stops. Um, and we want to know how much search trends increased for certain types of queries during this time. Right? So here are the biggest increases we saw. These are mostly group terms. So headache-related queries, like headache symptoms, headache diagnosis, just the word headache, these go up by about 41%. Chest pains go up 35%. Hernia, that was the best hernia picture I could find that I could show. Um, that's 37%. And uh, just to give you an example of one query, stomach ulcer symptoms as a query has this massive increase. Any one query isn't really informative, but it's interesting to see that one going up so much. Um, this is what it actually looks like. So here is our plot for uh, 2006 to the end of 2011. Each one of these little lines is one query. Um, and that's the pattern of the query over time. And so you can see that there are many things influencing queries over time. They go up and down. Uh, and if we look at any individual query, it looks kind of uh, random. But the bold line here is the mean of all the queries. And you can see that this is actually um, fairly stable for the first part. And then right here is where the Great Recession starts. You can see a notable increase. Right? So I'll just give you one example. Um, this is the query headache symptoms. Um, so you can see we fit, uh, this is a linear fit to uh, the query uh, patterns before uh, the Great Recession started. So it, it says it's going down, but what I basically interpret that as uh, is it's relatively flat because you don't really see a big increase or decrease. Um, but you can see that very clearly what's going on in the Great Recession, which is the shaded region, is a major increase, right? The number of people who are searching about headache symptoms went up quite a bit. Right? And so we can see that actually there's a fairly big impact on health as a result of uh, as a result of the recession, where people started searching much more for things about physical pain, stress, things like that during the recession. So this is a really interesting example of something that is very, very hard question to answer, but we were able to answer it by looking at um, query data. All right. So that's what I want to say about query data. We have like four other projects that we're in the middle of doing similar things for all different sorts of um, analyses. Uh, but it's very exciting stuff. Yeah. OK, yes? Um, so for the title of the paper, I would think that uh, headache wasn't the only thing you looked at? Did you look at? No, we looked at, there's like, a, well, we looked at a couple hundred things. So they're like headache, I mean, there's like headache, hernia, physical pain um, of all different uh, kinds. And the thing is, with those, these those are all things that got elevated by other Yeah, so time. aggregated all together, we see the increase. Each individual, so, um, uh, oh, right, I have to set those. Right, so these oh, are all individual things that increase. Yeah. Okay, right? 
Uh, and there's a lot more in the paper. And we also have statistics about like how many extra, like we have projections for how many extra queries there were because of the recession for these things. Like people get headaches no matter what, but how many extra headaches there were, that sort of thing. Um, yes? Did also something decrease? Um, uh, so we looked at health. I don't remember if anything significantly decreased because of health. Um, there are, I mean, you can apply the same analysis to other things. So, for example, divorce decreases during recession. Does anyone know why? Decreases. Decreases. Because the lawyers are expensive. Because lawyers are very expensive. People don't have money. Um, so, uh, which means that the, re when the economy recovers, there's a spike in divorce. Well, that's uh, tough demand. Yeah. I mean, it's serious. So, uh, so, we were just looking at health, and nothing we saw specifically, because we were looking for. Um, you know, these kind of like physical pain, that sort of stuff. You can imagine there might be sorts of uh, questions, health care, that, de that de do decrease. Like, you know, health insurance might decrease because more less people are looking for it. I I'm not really sure. Because I'm thinking if nothing decreases, it might be perhaps, you know, people have more time to see the computer. Um, right. So, um, so we do normalize by total query volumes. So... If it was the case that during the recession everyone had more time, so they just searched about their health more, but nothing else, then um, you could imagine this effect. But if it's people sitting and searching more overall, then uh, we don't, uh, we wouldn't be fooled by that. Okay. Uh, and of, of course, I mean, I should say, whenever you're talking about medical results, right, I, this is not a conclusive proof of anything. This is just a, uh, one attempt at answering question that people have had that we've never been able to really answer. Right? So the next step, I think, would be taking these results and building them into do like survey uh, style questionnaires. Yeah. How do you normalize for other sort of global health events? Like How do you normalize for what? Other global health events, like H1N1. Uh, right. So we didn't look at flu as a part of that. Oh, you mean how, if we're interested in flu, how do we normalize? Right. So I mean, H1N1 was 2009. 2009, yeah. Um, so, so that effect would not be, so like H1N1, for example, that wouldn't be a sustained effect through the Great Great Recession, because H1N1 kind of died off by the end of October, and also it had a huge peak in the middle of the, well, it's basically like two notable peaks. One was the summer, when everyone wanted to know what was going on, and then the other one was in um, January 2010, when it actually was kind of at the height. So, but it drops off really substantially after that. Um, so it might be that people were searching, you know, it could be that people increased headaches uh, searches for that. I don't really think they would. I mean, if, if I had the flu, headache would not, like headache symptoms would not be what I search for. It would be more flu-related stuff. But, uh, but that wouldn't explain the, the, the trend over the whole recession. Okay. Social media. Everyone knows what Twitter is. Great. Um, if you don't, I'm, I'm sorry. You just see me after uh, so, uh, why do we use Twitter? Um, a couple reasons. We have it, we have a lot of it, and uh, people write things in Twitter that are actually really indicative of health. So, here's some examples. Uh, nothing like waiting in line to buy cigarettes behind a guy in a business suit buying gasoline with $10 in dimes. So, uh, while that's amusing, what we actually learn from that is this person's probably a smoker, otherwise, why are they buying cigarettes? Right? So, it's not conclusive that they're smoking, but it's an indication of, of a smoker. Right? And so those are the sorts of things that people say incidentally on Twitter that we want to uh, try and mine to do interesting things. Um, so we've done a lot of interesting things with this. We've looked at uh, medication use. We've looked at patient safety, like medical error. That's a big thing here at Hopkins and the Armstrong Institute. We, uh, we're doing work now in mental health, uh, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, a whole bunch of things. Uh, what I want to talk about specifically today in detail is our work on disease surveillance, which is really kind of one of the first things we've done and uh, we, we haven't stopped yet. Uh, soon, we'll stop soon. Uh, okay, so disease surveillance. So if everyone remembers, last year was a pretty notable flu year. Um, even if you didn't know that, the fact that there's a New York Times article from January 2013 on the flu means it was a notable flu year. That's not something we normally see articles about. Um, and the reason it was notable is because uh, it reached what we would say is epidemic levels in the United States. Right? The, the rate of uh, flu infection was much, much higher than we normally see. Not once in 100 years, but like once in 10 years sort of high. Uh, I don't know exactly how the, the statistic was when the last time it was that bad. Um, so uh, why do we care about this? So most people in this room, hopefully, who have had the flu, 
uh, get the flu, they're out for a couple days, and then they come back and their life moves on. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's not how the flu goes. The flu is actually a very serious illness, and there are many, many people who die or are hospitalized every year in the United States from the flu. Right? I, don't, I really should look up the statistic about what percentage of uh, annual deaths are from the flu. Michael, if you know, you can shout it out. But, all right. um, so it's actually a really big impact on public health. And so as a result, the CDC spends a lot of time, effort, and money on influenza. It's one of their uh, big areas where they focus attention. So the way they do surveillance for the flu, right, where they want to know basically how many people right now have the flu, is they have what they call their ILM, uh, their, um, their ILM network, a, a different name for it. Um, so they have 2,700 outpatient centers throughout, or also some hospitals throughout the United States. And these centers report weekly to the CDC how many people showed up that had influenza-like illness. And what that means is you went to see the doctor and you said, gosh, I have a fever and I have the chills and I've been home for two days. And the doctor says, really, that sounds like the flu. Here's some medicine, go home. That gets reported as ILI, okay? Um, critically, it doesn't mean that you actually have the flu. It just means that you're someone who looks like they have the flu. There's a separate metric they use for um, confirmed flu, flu cases, but that's less interesting and less useful for most people than the ILI number. Right? So the main problems with this is it takes a while for them to compile it. It's about two weeks for them to um, collect and publish the data. Even once they do that, as we've discovered, they update it frequently. So even though they publish a number the next week, they might make minor or even major revisions to it. So it really takes a while to collect this data. And also, there's varying levels of geographic granularity. So the CDC really focuses on regions. There's 10 regions in the United States. They have some state-level data, but they really don't have things in like Baltimore, right? But the problem is, if you're a hospital in Baltimore, you kind of care about what's going on in Baltimore more than you care about what's going on in the United States. All right, so we're going to build the Twitter surveillance system for influenza. And it's going to have three components that we think are new and interesting. One is we're going to show that we can accurately track ground truth infection. Um, and we're going to have a methods based on the NLP, so good for us, um, that are improvements over what other people have been doing. Um, we're going to show that we can do this not just at the national level, which is what everyone's shown, but at the local level, um, so cities. And we want to show that we can not only do this historically, like download old CDC data and show that we can do well, but we can actually build a system and run it on real data coming in and do well. Right. So let me go through each of these points. So uh, you guys are familiar with the complexities of natural language processing. Um, not everyone is, which is why I have this slide, but I'll show you the examples because they're cute. So the most common thing people do is they look for the word flu, which would get them this tw uh, these tweets. The Ray Lewis flu, does anyone know what that is? I went somewhere where no one had heard of Ray Lewis. Does anyone know who Ray Lewis is in Baltimore? Okay, good, just making sure. It's amazing to me. This is what happens when you leave Baltimore. So Ray Lewis was the linebacker uh, who retired last year for um, the Baltimore Ravens, and apparently his uh, attack of the offensive players was so fearsome that offensive players and the opposing teams would feel ill the week before playing him. That's called the Ray Lewis flu. Not contagious. Um, Mom, I can't go to school tomorrow. I have the swag flu. Does anyone know what swag flu is? Show of hands. No? One? Do you want to define it, or should I? Uh... Well, swagger is sort of like the way you walk and the way you present yourself to the world. If you got a lot of swagger, you're pretty suave. Yeah. So if you got the swag flow, I'd imagine that you're so you're so fly you have to stay home. So very good. I like this. So I'll read the Urban Dictionary definition, which I, I love, so I'll read it anyway. Swag flu is a contagious virus that spreads game, confidence, and swagger among the populations of, of individuals. So very good, that was, that was good. Um, so uh, as, de as deadly as that might be, uh, we don't actually care about tracking it. Um, uh, or at least no one at the CDC has approached me about tracking it, so we haven't looked at it. Um, and you can see other things like this in the data. So um, keywords is not on and on This is not just a cute problem, it's a serious problem. Here is uh, the summer of 2009. And the curve I'm showing you is what our system thinks the flu rate is, and I'll explain later where that curve comes from. And what is odd here is that there is a big spike in the flu in the middle of summer, and it, that's not common. So um, when you say our system, do you mean one that just looks for the word flu? Uh, it's it's a little bit more advanced than that, but I'll explain later what it is. But it's basically just doing a more naive stuff. Okay, so this is the baseline system. Right? This is the baseline system. Well, this is one of the baseline systems. It's still a statistical system, but it's, it's not, uh, you'll see in a minute. Um, 
So, uh, so we see this big spike here. Uh, is that an infection spike or not? So actually what happened on that day in 2009 was the World Health Organization declared that swine flu would be a pandemic. So as much as that raised awareness about the flu, I don't think this press release made anyone sick. Um, and so the fact that the system confuses these things is a bad problem. Right? It's not just this system that would do that. Uh, last year, there were some uh, very interesting articles published in uh, Science News. Science News? Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, the title was like, Google Flu Trends Doesn't Work. Uh, it was a little bit more diplomatic than that. And the point of the article was that because there was so much um, media interest in the flu that year, there were all these articles, uh, people were searching for the flu even though they didn't have it, and it misled Google flu trends to way overestimate the, the flu rate. Um, so it's not just a problem on Twitter, it's a problem with uh, Google data as well. So, so that's uh, going to be difficult for you even if you uh, leave out articles like this, right? So you said this article didn't make anybody sick, but it may yes. make people think they're sick. Uh, right. And that might show up uh, even with more subtle measures. Right. So uh, to convince Jason, I will show you this plot again at the very end of uh, this section and show you that we can get better. Cool. Okay. Well, Anticipate it. Yes. Do these symptoms also peak here as well as the word flu? Um, this is just uh, tweets that we our, our baseline system identified as uh, being about the flu, which is what people typically use to do flu tracking. But if you ignore words like flu and H1N1, which are... Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. The best I can say is there's work uh, uh, from um, University of Rome um, that was just published, I saw on FOSS, but I've known about for a while, where they have a theory that you shouldn't track the word flu at all, you should just look for symptoms of flu, and don't really let people rely on self-diagnosis, and they show benefits to doing that. So we're, we don't do that, but um, that is an approach that some people do take. Um, but it still doesn't eliminate the problem of, hy of uh, news-induced hypochondria, right? No, it does not. Um, and I don't think our approach is going to eliminate it, but it's going to make things much, much better. Okay, so, um, so we use a, a set of three classifiers. Um, the first one is we just identify tweets as being about health or not. All this training data comes from mechanical turf. Um, so uh, that's our first stage. That gets rid of, actually, the first stage is a keyword search for health-related terms, and we've got uh, a lot of them. So we get a lot of data that's not actually about health. It's a high recall phase. Uh, then we have this high precision phase where we filter things out using a uh, classifier uh, so that it's really only about health. Uh, then we have another classifier that doesn't just look for the word flu, but it actually is trained on uh, tweets that are about flu and not about flu. Uh, and it tries just to find those that are actually about flu. So this gets rid of like swag flu, Ray Lewis flu, uh, things like that, fever, fever. Uh, and then the, the last step is uh, awareness versus infection. So this is actually the, the most uh, helpful and really the most interesting step. So what we're doing here is we want to distinguish between people who say, I am infected with influenza versus I am uh, worried about being infected with, uh, with influenza. So the example uh, tweets I have here, uh, on the left, so many Americans seem to have bad flu right now. I'm worried this trend will reach New Zealand in the winter. I might need to step up my inclusiveness. So this person doesn't have the flu, even though they're talking about the flu. Uh, and then the one on the right is my flu, cough, and fever is getting worse. I'm worried. This person, we would say, has the flu, right? And so we built a system to distinguish between those things. Uh, we have a NACL paper on that last year, and it's basically uh, a lot of shallow features, part of speech tags, things like that, to try and distinguish between uh, these two types of uh, tweets. Okay. We have a lot of training data. We train that model. So that's how we accurately track ground truth. Right? We identify this distinction between awareness of disease and infection of disease, as opposed to just who's talking about the disease, either with a, a classifier or with keywords. Um, so the second thing, can we be effective at tracking flu, not just at the national level, but municipal level? Yes? Just a quick question. So just because I say I have the flu doesn't mean I have Ah, yes. All the doctors ask this, too. So are you a doctor? Yes, you are. You are. Um, so uh, my response to that is simply, this works. So um, which indicates that however bad the problems with the data are. So one problem is people uh, misdiagnose themselves. Right? Another one is that our systems have error. Another one is that the uh, population is biased in all sorts of ways. Right? There are many problems with the data, but the system works which doesn't say that those problems are real, it just says that the strength of the signal for influenza is such that it can overcome those issues. For other issues, 
uh, that we look at, those, uh, those biases in the data might uh, actually cause problems. And so we do spend time thinking about how to account for them. So, so what do you say it's, uh, about signal? I, I think you're saying something a little bit more precise. Uh, the, um, when you say it works, it works up to a multiplicative constant. Like you're assuming that 1% of the people who have the flu will tweet about it or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, know, you don't know if it's 1% or not. Um, but all you see is that you track uh, the actual rate of the flu up to some constant. And if 10% of the uh, people who say they have the flu don't actually have it, um, then you'll be off by a constant factor as long as it's always. Yes, so. yes, that's right. And that's what, so that's essentially, right. So that's what I mean by it works well enough is that the error there is much smaller, right? The 10% error is much smaller than the overall thing that we have. And so we still. No, I'm telling you that. What if, it, you know, if it's three, if it's uh, a th only if two thirds of the people who say that they have the flu don't have it. Um, right, so there's You're still going to just be off by a factor of three, but it'll still track. Right, right. so there's this other effect that's actually important, which is uh, people's perception of what they have is influenced by people around them. Right. And so, so if I say I have the flu, it's yeah. probably because other people have the flu, so I think I have it. So even if you don't have the flu, you're somewhat reporting on other people's illness. So right? how, would, how would can ground truth be anyway? Because when I get the flu, I don't tell anybody. Right, you don't? You should, uh, there's a service I should sign you up for. Um, no, I'm serious, there is. I mean, you're off by a multiplicative constant right. anyway, so, the ground truth has to be up. Yeah, so this is a very important point, which is the CDC data that we're tracking is itself uh, inaccurate, right? However, there is nothing more accurate than that to the rest of our knowledge, so everyone compares against it. Uh, but it absolutely has issues, and uh, our error might be uh, due not to... Uh, the quality of our data might just be the fact that there's uh, issues in the way they track flu as well. Just the, that's the reality here. All right. So, um, all right. So we want to uh, we want to get uh, signals for uh, specific locations, right? So most people, um, there's one other paper that, uh, that came out the same time ours did that looks at something besides national uh, flu. Uh, but uh, besides that, everyone looks at national rates. Uh, the problem is that we actually need local rates to make decisions. So there are lots of things you can do if you know the flu rate's going up. If you're a hospital, you need to call more doctors to the ER, clear more beds, stock up on Tamiflu. If you're a pharmacies, you need to stock up on uh, thermometers. Actually, you can track the flu by uh, uh, monitoring thermometer sales. Um, uh, you can, uh, if you uh, run a school district, uh, you want to know what's going on with the school district, whether you should close. If you remember H1N1, a lot of schools closed because they want to prevent infection spread. There's advertising campaigns for a while. There was a billboard as I got off the highway here at Hopkins that was advertising something about the flu. It was in Spanish, so I don't really know, but it was about the flu. Um, anyway, if someone remembers this billboard and speaks Spanish, they can tell me what it what, what is that. Um, uh, the problem is that. Uh, Twitter data is uh, mostly not geocoded. It's about at 3% now. This slide is actually a little bit off. Uh, in the US, it's about 3% of tweets are being geocoded. Um, but that's really not, not necessarily enough data for us to do local trends, because it throws away most of what we have. Um, so instead, we're just going to do something very simple that now lots of people are doing. So I'm very happy. Hopefully, they're using our code to do it. Um, well, we're going to look at the profile information. So this is uh, six users and their profiles. So you can see that they say things like New York, New York is the location, uh, Florida, Arizona. So people have uh, varying granularities of location that they're providing. Um, uh, we can get things like New York with lots of E's and O's. There's a pretty easy reg app you can write that gets most of these. Um, but I'll admit, does anyone know where that is? Yeah, I grew up there. You grew up there. Do you want to try saying it then? Uh, well, I don't have the classic text. Does anyone want to try and say it? New Jersey. There you go. Uh, I don't think our system knows about that, but I don't know why. I just don't have it. Um, so, uh, so we built a system that basically can look at these strings and identify where in the world they are. Um, that's called Carmen. Um, we have 4,000 known locations, and the tests we have uh, show that our um, geolocation goes from about 1% of the data we looked at to 22% of the data. Um, there are others that have taken this approach um, to a, a greater extreme, and they're companies, so they have a lot more money to throw at this, uh, and they're reporting things uh, much higher in terms of the geolocation rate. Um, but this is a very useful tool for us. We hope it's a useful tool for other people, so we post it uh, in Java and Python if they want to use it. Um, all right, so that gets us a lot more location data. Um, so the last question is, is this predictive, right? So can we take your classifiers, combine it with the location, and actually do something interesting or accurate? Uh, here's historical data. So uh, keywords is just um, 
Um, the uh, Health and Human Services has a couple keywords for Twitter that we recommend for flu. That's what this is. Uh, flu classifier is the first two stages of our pod pipeline, but not the infection versus awareness. Google flu trends is Google's data. Um, so in 2009, you see basically everything did the same. It was actually a really easy year. That was the H1N1 year. 2011 was hard because it was a mild year, and so there were much uh, more subtle trends to detect. Uh, and you can see how different systems do. So you notice in 2011, there was a big gap between Twitter and Google. Uh, here's how our system does. So 2009 gets a little bit better, but it doesn't really matter. In 2011, you see a pretty substantial increase over both um, of the Twitter methods, cutting the error compared to Google roughly in half. Right? Um, but that's historical data. How do we do it in real time? So we built this and submitted it to ACL 2013, which means we built it fall 2012. We then took that system and ran it on the flu season of 2012-2013, uh, which turned out to be a really interesting flu season. We didn't really know that was going to happen. Um, if we had known that, we would have published that paper. Um, anyway, so uh, the black line is the CDC trend. The blue line is our system. And you can see it roughly tracks uh, pretty well. Uh, we get the peak right here. We kind of get a smaller peak here, but OK, it's overall pretty good. Uh, this dotted line is just influenza tweets. Um, not filtered by awareness. You can see there's two peaks that are really unexplained. The first is in early December. The second is in early January. Um, early January is when the big media campaign happened. So we see a huge increase in tweets around that. And early December is when the CDC announced that flu season was particularly bad. And so there was a smaller increase of coverage around that. Um, uh, here are the correlation coefficients. I don't know exactly offhand what Google did, but I think we're very, very close to Google flu trends for this year. Um, I don't know if there's, I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be statistically significant differences. Um, and a couple people did publish how they were doing on this flu season earlier on, and we were beating them pretty handily at that point. Um, these are the best numbers I've seen. Michael, is that right? Yeah, okay. Yes? Uh, did you tell us how Google Flu Trends works? I, know I on the didn't. Slide. Uh, I didn't, and I don't have time. Like it's based on Google queries, and I can tell you afterwards how it works. Yeah, okay. Think about what you would do, and then step back three levels. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, Jason, four <laughs> levels. Um, and what else? Three. Yeah. So it looks like your error is worse sort of in the holiday season. Is that? Holiday season. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't, I'm not sure whether you should read too much into that. I mean, are there things like people just, you know, certain times of the year don't use Twitter very much at all? Uh, good question, Miles. Okay, that's the authoritative answer. I don't know. So uh, the CDC data also seems to have particular patterns around the holiday season because way fewer people bother to go to the hospital. So they do normalize for that, but you definitely, I don't know if it's biasing in some way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then uh, the next thing we want to do is show that we can do this for a city. So we pick New York City because, look, they have data. Uh, most cities don't have data. Uh, however, the data that they have that we actually need, they do not share publicly. So we saw this as an opportunity. So what we said was, we will send you our predictions, and then you will do the analysis so that we have no control over the answer, and then you will just tell us how well we did. So that's what we call a, a blind evaluation. Um, and this is what they told us. Um, that infection, 0.88, keywords, 0.72. They did not send us a curve, so I can't show you the curve. Um, uh, but uh, the number 0.88 here, uh, the things to take away from this is one, it's, it's improving over the baseline again. And it's not much different. In fact, it's just barely statistically significant from the national trend. Uh, and so what that means is that we're doing almost as well in a much smaller geographic area as we would nationally. Uh, you guys want to know how we're doing this year? This is, I think, two weeks out of date now, but this is how we're doing this year on the same system. Um, so uh, this is Twitter. It's black is CDC. It looks like we captured the peak at the right place. Um, we have a 0.95 correlation this year so far. You can't really compare that, though, to the correlations before because it's over a different span of time. Right? Um, although our correlations actually tend to be very, very consistent throughout the season. It's not like uh, they're all in the low 90s or uh, low to mid 90s, uh, whatever you measure. Um, so this is a plot I promised to show Jason. Uh, this is the influenza uh, classifier baseline. Uh, here is our new system. And you see it basically ignores uh, any increase from the uh, who, uh, media coverage. OK. I got to move on, because there's one more thing. Oh, uh, if you want this data, we're going to be releasing it online soon. Uh, or you can just ask me, because you're sitting in the room. It's probably easier than going to our website. Um, web forums. All right. so. 
Uh, you can do a lot with web forms. And this is often overlooked by uh, this community. Uh, we're doing a lot of different stuff here. We're looking at quality of care. You can actually, it's really unbelievable how you can measure um, state level uh, correlates with uh, quality of care based on what people write in forums uh, about the doctors. Uh, prescription drug use, uh, we're looking at uh, aspects of that in forum data. What I want to talk about is about uh, illicit drug use. Uh, hopefully the pills and the dollar bills next to each other uh, indicate illicitness. Um, because these pills look the same as other pills. Okay. Um, so let me first tell you about the data set and I'll tell you about why we're using it. So we're using a data set called uh, Drugs, um, Drugs Forum. Uh, I'll just read you what they say. Uh, Drugs Forum is an information hub of high standards and a platform where people can freely discuss recreational drugs in a mature and intelligent manner. Drugs Forum offers a wealth of quality information and discussion of drug-related politics in addition to assistance for members struggling with addiction. So you see it covers a lot of different things. We're basically focused on discuss recreational drugs. That's what we want, that's what we care about. So we have 100,000 messages written by 20,000 users. Uh, the self-reported statistics are 87% male. Um, that seems very high, but I don't have a good way of evaluating that. 50% um, American, uh, it also has like Canada, UK, and then other languages that we don't look at. Uh, and then the age uh, breakdown, uh, it goes all the way up to the age 119, is that it? Or something like that? 100-ish. It's 100, okay. Um, so uh, we, we have a long tail uh, of, uh, there's actually a lot of users of 120s, and we kind of throw them away. Uh, we, don't, we don't use those in the age statistics we do. Um, but uh, I don't believe this number because you have to be 18 years old to sign up for the website, and I know that people under that age also like to use the internet and do drugs, so they're probably on this website, so they're probably lying about their age. So these age breakdowns are not necessarily very accurate. Uh, okay, so why do we care about this? So let me tell you a little bit about the world of illicit drugs. Um, so for a long time, this world was dominated by the big names, right? What are the big names of drugs? Don't be shy. Heroin. Ooh, there's a UK connection. I'll do that there. Speed. Johnson. <laughs> Ecstasy. Miles is getting off them. Come on, guys. <laughs> what? Quaaludes. Quaaludes. I don't even know what that is. Okay. It's a speech joke. Uh, anything else? Meth. Cocaine. Ketamine. What? Ketamine. Ketamine. Ketamine's a smaller one, but yes. Nitrous oxide, blue, other uh, blue. Elmer's is not as popular. Those are discussed. Uh, I don't know if Elmer's blue is discussed. Um, probably not in the same depth or seriousness as the other drugs. Um, but there's, a, I mean, it's unbelievable what people put into their bodies for different effects. I mean, what, what happens, for example, is there's like a veterinary medication that is like not really controlled because it's for dogs, and then all of a sudden you have a lot of people, and you were ordered online, and all of a sudden there'll be a big spike in people taking it because they realize it gets them high, and then the government has to come in and control dog medicine, okay? So this is what happens. People just do crazy things. All right, so that's what it used to be like. It's changed a lot in the past couple of years. Now there are a lot of new drugs. Um, there was a study out from the EU on uh, showing that they average one new drug a week. In fact, this is the UK connection. There's a widespread belief without much evidence, but we're trying to show it, that the UK is a major source of drug innovation in the US that basically all the really good ideas start off there and make their way over to us. <laughs> so that's why you're here this year, I guess. Um, uh, so um, the problem is that these new drugs, because there's so many of them, uh, doctors are just not familiar with them. And this creates a whole lot of problems. So if you go into the ER because you've overdosed, and the doctor says, what have you taken? Forget the fact that you might not be able to speak. What have you taken? And if the doctor's never heard of the drug, they don't know what kind of drug it is, they don't know how much you should have taken, they don't know what to do. I mean, it's a big problem, okay? Um, if you go to see someone about your addictions, right, and they're trying to help you uh, with your addiction and they don't know what drugs you're taking because they've never heard of them, it's very hard to do the job. Policymakers, when they're trying to decide which drugs we should control, which drugs we should study, right, uh, all these different sorts of things, if they've never heard of the drug or they don't know anything about it, they're at a loss. So this is a huge problem, and um, we're very interested in looking at this data because this is a data set that talks about these drugs fairly early on, before they show up in other traditional data sources, right? So for example, salvia. How many people have heard of salvia? Yeah. Okay, so salvia is a, a fairly recent drug. It's not actually popular that enough people have heard of it. Uh, and we just have very basic questions, right? Um, 
what demographic groups are using this drug? Is it, is it adults? Is it uh, teenagers? Is it men, women? Um, how are people using stealth here? Like smoking it, injecting it, snorting it, eating it. Um, there are other ways. Uh, what are the effects of taking salvia? You know, what do you feel like? Uh, what are the negative health implications? These are all questions that we don't have answers to because it's a relatively new drug. Right? Salvia is a case of a drug that got very popular, and so now we know information about it. Does anyone know why salvia is very popular? It was legal. It's, it was. It's, I don't, it's now, uh, it depends on the states. Uh, it also, obviously, it depends on the state, it depends on the country as well. Um, but it certainly started off as legal uh, and is now moving to the illegal camp. But does anyone know why uh, it's popular? Many, many things are legal like that you have, but why did Salve become so popular? No, I know. Okay, this is a little bit trivia. Uh, Miley Cyrus. So there is a YouTube video of her smoking um, a bong with Salvia. Uh, it got posted online. This is just one, uh, there are many copies online. And, and believe it or not, kids like Miley Cyrus, and so they started smoking Salvia too. Uh, and there was actually, I think it's Salvia, there's this trend of teenagers uh, basically getting in front of their computers, taking Salvia, and then recording themselves doing crazy things the next half hour, and then they post it to YouTube. Um, uh, I don't know if these videos are still up there, but for a while you can find tons of these videos of teenagers doing crazy stuff when they're hot. Anyway, um, but just to show you actually, YouTube is a very serious source of this stuff. What's the number one recommended other video? Justin Bieber smoking weed. Um, he was in the news again. Bieber, Bieber's back. Okay. Um, so the way we're going to study this corpus is we're going to use uh, topic models. The reason we want to use topic models is we have, uh, at the heart of what we're doing is an exploratory task. Right? We have a lot of corpus of data. Um, people actually do already use this corpus to study drugs, but what they do is they basically just read lots and lots of forward messages, thousands of these things. They'll code them, and then they'll write a paper. Uh, and we want to enable much better analysis of the data. So we want to enable people to find things that are of direct interest to answering their questions. Uh, topic models are a promising way of doing this. The trouble, though, is topic models can only do this uh, topical division of the data. And so what we have is uh, factorial LDA, which... Michael, have you talked about this here? No. Okay, no. All right, Friday? Next Friday? Two Fridays? You're not talking about this? All right. Fine. So I'll say a little bit more. Um, so what, to, uh, what FLDA does is it models uh, corpus not as just topics, but it's a joint model of multiple aspects. So let's say you're interested in topics and sentiment, both of which can affect what appears in the document. So we actually can model those jointly by saying that words are not going to be chosen just based on the topic that they come from, but they're also going to be chosen based on the fact that they're topic and they're this sentiment. right? And we can do this for an arbitrary number of, of uh of factors. So for example, on L ACL abstracts, we did um, the topic of the abstract, the approach, and the perspe method, perspective, yeah, method. method, right? So you got things like theory, um, it was like theoretical methods of speech, or empirical evaluations of MT, like those sorts of things, as, as topics, right? Um, so that's the idea of FLDA. I'm not going to go into the details of how it works. Um, I'll just talk about a very high level, okay? Um, so we used a three-factor um, FLDA model for this data set. The first factor is going to come from the drug. So we have 24 different drugs we're looking at. Those are some of them. The delivery, how you get the drug into your system, whether you inject it, you take it orally, you smoke it, you snort it. Uh, there are like 20 or 10 different ways to get drugs in, so I'll give you guys extra points if you can name them all. Um, actually, I don't want to know if you can name them all. <laughs> uh, and then the aspect, which is things like the chemistry of the drug, the culture around it, the effects of taking it, the health impact, and uh, how people typically use it. So, for example, if you look at the topic that is discovered, or the joint topic that's discovered for um, uh, alcohol, oral, culture, you see a lot of words like parties, frat parties, college, that sort of thing. Where if you look at like um, meth uh, injection, you inject meth, I don't want to know. Meth, something else, and culture, you see a lot of words that are not, I don't want to say that. But there's a very different culture around that, okay? Um, and heroin and things like that. So you really can see very interesting things fall out of the data. Um, so this is some example of the word distributions we learned. So for cocaine snorting health, we get things like nose pain, damaged blood. Uh, cocaine snorting usage, we have things like coke, lines, cut, small. So um, what's interesting is what L FLDA does is it says, I want to learn these two distributions. These distributions should be, for all intents and purposes, the same, except for the fact that one is about health and one is about usage. 
right? And so the only difference in these two distributions should be words um, that belong to health and usage, but in the respect that they're both about cocaine and snorting, they should be the same, right? And you really see this as you look at the larger list. So the question is, how do we actually make that happen in this data? Right? How do we ensure that FMDA learns that sort of thing? Um, so the way we do it is we first learn um, general word lists. These are not necessarily distributions. Yeah? What does small mean in the previous slide? I don't know. Cocaine snorting usage small. Does anyone want to make it? I don't know a lot of people. They do cocaine, but only a little bit. A little bit? Michael, do you happen to know? It's hard to say with the entire word approach, but maybe it's small. Line or something. Yeah, I have to look at data sometime, you know. So we actually have ways of expanding these to phrases and stuff like that that I'm not showing here. And those usually are more illustrative. And when we show them to users, like in a practical setting, that's what we'll have. Um, so how do we get how do we get this to happen where these tuples are very similar in behavior, right? So I just want to give you an intuition for how this happens. Um, so what the model actually done is, is it learns separate word lists for every one of the factors. So cannabis, oral chemistry, by themselves, have word lists that the model learns for them. So this is words that are generally associated with chemistry, regardless of the drug. Words generally associated with taking something orally, regardless of the drug or how you're using it. And you can see that it kind of captures that. And these are words generally associated with cannabis, regardless of what you're going to do with it. And right? how you generate these lists? These are uh, inferred from the data. Right? So there are every, everything I'm going to show you, except if I say otherwise, is unsupervised from the data. Um, so each one of these is basically a, a weight vector over the vocabulary. So when it comes time to say, we want a distribution, model, give us a distribution for cannabis oral chemistry, what we do is we take these, um, we combine them to get a, uh, a word list that reflects all three. Right? So this word list is in some sense a combination of the words associated with each one. Right? So this is what the model expects cannabis oral chemistry documents to talk about. Of course, what the model thinks about the world and the world are very different things. And so we just use that as a prior. And we say, well, given that that's what you think the word list should be, um, why don't you actually use that as the uh, parameters for a uh, Dirichlet and sample the actual distribution that corresponds to cannabis oral chemistry. And so what this allows the model to do is fit the data, because it gets to fit this distribution in the data, but be heavily influenced by general trends across cannabis, oral chemistry. Right? And this way, you can have cannabis, oral chemistry, cannabis, oral usage, and they're encouraged to be very, very similar, except for that one list that went in the different <laughs> shades of talk. So cannabis, oral chemistry, what are all those tweet, uh, what are all those messages going to be talking about? Does anyone want to guess? You have a word list. What? THC and brownies. THC and brownies. Yes, pop brownies. OK. Um, and that's what these messages are. Um, so. Uh, we want to answer these sorts of questions. You know, how are people using salvia? What are the effects of salvia? Things like this. So the way we're going to do it using this model is extractive summarization. What we do is we run our model on the corpus, and then we say, if someone wants to know about how people take uh, cannabis orally, we're going to find the sentences that are best explained by that tool. Right? And then we normalize so that we don't you know, we get uh, reasonable and things like that. So here's what our model found. Um, how are people using uh, salvia? So oral, uh, I'm sorry, smoking versus oral usage of salvia. And we get things like the best way is to use a torch lighter, bong or pipe, bong, bong recommended, that's not my recommendation, it's person's. Uh, and hold in each hit 20 to 40 seconds. Um, uh, that seems like a really good explanation of how to uh, use salvia or, uh, smoking. Orally, I'm not gonna read this because it's kind of dry, but it's very detailed instructions of exactly how to take salvia orally. Uh, we also can then ask about the effects of taking salvia. Um, so we see things like uh, the oral effects when chewed, the first effects are felt after about 15 minutes, and then explains more. Um, that seems great. Uh, here, salvia smoking effects. He then took one large hit and held it in, and then you have this very description, orangish, brownish light. Right? People are explaining what happens to them when they take this drug. So these seem like really good matches. So um, two points. So one is uh, I just want to point to a kind of an interesting aspect of the data. So he then one uh, he then took one large hit. So who is he? Like who is this person talking about? So one of the rules of drug forms is this is for discussing recreational drugs, but no one here takes drugs. Okay? And so as a rule, you cannot say I took this drug because that's against the policy of the forum. So instead, everyone on the forum has friends who take drugs. And so people write things like SWIM, which stands for someone who isn't me, blah, blah, blah. 
And then people will reply, Sui, which is someone who isn't you, blah, blah, blah. People will get much more creative. So uh, there was one was, um, my pet, Rabbit Harold, parentheses, 6'2", male, 250 pounds, went to the girlfriend, uh, went to the club with his girlfriend for the weekend, and did the following right? So um, that's really kind of just an interesting side, like the data, and you actually see it show up on topics. Um, the second thing is, how do we know this actually works, right? So I've just shown you some examples, but you can't publish a paper on examples alone. Well, sometimes top model paper, but you shouldn't be able to publish on uh, examples alone. Uh, and so we did two things. One, we showed this to our colleagues in uh, behavioral psychiatry, and they said, wow, these look great, good job. Um, we also can't publish a paper based on that. So we did a study. What we did was we found technical reports that were written about drugs, and we exerted the paragraphs that describe you know, the smoking effects and the smoking usage and things like that. And we showed that paragraph along with a bunch of sentences that our system and baseline systems extracted, and we asked, which one is helpful for writing this report? And our system was picked uh, more than any other system. And if you want to know exactly how much was picked, you can see the paper. This is a NACL paper. Um, and we're currently submitting this work to the uh, drug uh, addiction community um, with a bunch more results. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about this sort of data. There's a lot of people to thank, so I listed them all here. They've all worked on some of this. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more about this work, you can uh, just come and find me. Uh, or, or Michael or a bunch of other people. Uh, but we also have a website that lists some of the projects we've been working on. Uh, and of course, if there's something you guys want to show data, all that, just ask. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. You had your first. So you made, a, you made a point at the beginning of, of the drug forum about how rapidly new drugs are coming on. Yes. Can, can you use any of, do you have any, any way to track what the new drugs are? And can, can right. You, so. Um, informative thing for... Right, so this project was an exploratory uh, project um, that just showed us what the data was like. We have a list of years worth of research now that we want to do, uh, and that's one of the main issues. Um, so uh, we know that this data supports that. So bath salts, they know what bath salts are? And if you think you put them in your bath, you're not thinking the right thing. You have to think zombie. You have to think zombie. That is the right thing, although that is a misnomer, but Zombie is the right thing to think about if you know what's talking about. Anyway, so they were very popular recently because um, they caused cannibalism. Actually, not true, but that's what people thought. Uh, so they, a drug that causes cannibalism is going to get a lot of attention, so it did. Um, uh, that was last year. We have messages from 2006 or 2007, I think, talking about axons. So we know that this stuff shows up way early, like years before it hits the mainstream. And part of that is because there's so many new drugs coming out, most of them don't make it. Um, only a couple of them actually that make it to the big time, uh, if bath salts is even a big time. And bath salts is still a very niche sort of drug that most people don't use, uh, but you know, certain communities it's just really crap because of the UK thing again. You think I'm making that up? Seriously, the UK thing. They give us drugs. Um, anyway, so we have a lot of questions that we want to ask about this data. It's problem. Other questions, things you guys want to know? Yeah? No, I'm just curious. If you tried a consensus model, Google would tweet or, tweets, for example, for flu, would that improve things? Google yeah. Plus tweets. Oh, wow, we're yeah. going to about that. Uh, <laughs> no, um, uh, will it improve things? So, well, yes, because the rule of ensemble learning is when you add more things, it always gets better. So there are technical difficulties, though, in adding these things together. Um, part of the big difference between what Google does and what we do, and this, actually this is huge, uh, it's kind of amazing that we do as well as we do, given this difference. So we don't train on CDC data. So nothing I said has anything to do with CDC data except evaluation. So in that sense, we have an unsupervised method. Okay? We don't call it unsupervised because we're training classifiers and labeled data, but it's unsupervised in that what we're trying to learn and track, we don't see. Google's is a supervised system. They actually look at lots of historical data and they fit models to it. Um, so Google can do that um, because of the nature of their data and also they have years worth of data Twitter has not been around long enough for us to fit reasonable models. When we've talked to people about doing this, um, their response was, you don't have enough years of training in the yet in order to, to do this. Um, my response was, I have ways around that, um, but we have not pursued it. Um, so it is something we've thought of. I think, in practice, the way this stuff gets used, I'll tell you what the state of Maryland does, for example. The state of Maryland has a weekly flu report they put out. And they don't say the flu rate of Maryland is X. What they do is they say, they have a paragraph describing the data sources they have and what they seem to be. And they have a bunch of data sources. 
And they show all of them, and they try and paint a more nuanced, complete picture of what's going on. Right? So in practice, even though we're showing these correlation numbers, that's not what people care about. People care about making decisions. And so the question is, how can we support those decision-making processes? So for example, we've evaluated um, in weeks where there's a substantial change in the rate of the flu, how accurately does our system guess the direction of that change? And we're 100% accurate on that. And I think that's a more useful output. Um, we'll talk a lot more about this, but I'll answer the question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so three questions, two very quick ones. Three. And, and a hard one. Right? So do you think that using the 1%, this is, this is the flu stuff. Okay. Do you think using the 1% hurts you? We don't use the 1%. Oh, good. Okay. So, so no. that, 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 that easy question. That second one yeah. is why don't you do geolocation prediction instead of just using the, the tweaks that the 1% are expanded set up? Because uh, it's more work than we have time. So there are a whole bunch of things we can do on top of what we're doing. Um, this set is also, the, the Carmen is actually based on an expanded set that we got from a paper that I think David, me, Ben, a couple people were on, and Shane last year at NACL about learning. Um, one of the things it did, it used a social network of Twitter to learn a bunch of uh, uh, associations between things. And one of the things it gave us was lists of um, locations that are synonymous, so we use like that list as well uh, to give us a little bit more expansion. There are other things you can do, like if someone says, uh, you know, certain words associated with Baltimore a lot, you identify them as being in Baltimore. Um, we don't do that primarily because it means we have to look at more than one tweet at a time, and that makes things harder. So that's true. I mean, sometimes you have enough signal from a single tweet. Okay. Um, but we, we are thinking about things like that, but it, it's, it's harder so we haven't done it. Yeah, but, but the real question is about bias in the data. Bias? Bias. Bias. Right. Okay. So the thing about the CDC sort of uh, uh, surveys and so on is, is you have an idea of your people, but you actually see them, right? Yes. You, know, you, you never see, you never really know whether there are people or maybe bots and so on and so forth. Yes. So it's always going to be this uncertainty about the results that you get from Twitter. Right, so that is true. So it depends on what you're trying to do. So when you're trying to do disease surveillance, there is no way we're going to replace uh, what the CDC has. Right? And basically the conversations with the CDC are not how do we replace what you have, but how do we add one more data point to give you a better picture. They're not going to uh, take apart their network. So for them, that I mean, if they're just, there's a, a certain level of trust they're not willing to put into it. For other applications that we're looking at, there is no data. Like basically, people have, I mean, there's areas that we're looking at where there's only theoretical studies published because no one has ever had a data set to answer these questions. So even though there's bias, it is data with bias as opposed to no data. And so the questions we deal with is like, okay, can we measure bias, can we account for bias, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but it's just a, such a, a, an improvement over the status quo that we try and improve it. It also helps that surveys, which are the gold standard in public health, have all these same problems. So surveys undersample young people, they undersample cell phones, people are known to get by, um, uh, censored answers to surveys depending on sensitive topics, there's priming problems, I mean, there's tons of problems with surveys. I mean, if you actually look at polling in detail, it's amazing that any of it works. Um, and yet, because it's the data that people have, we have a huge community around accounting for these problems and trying to address them. So I think the same thing is going to be true of these data sources as well. This is the general problem with yeah. all work on social media. And it'd be nice if someone actually addressed this or tried to address it. Right. So my suspicion is that for other sorts of problems we're looking at, where bias will have a bigger impact, then we will need to do some accounting for bias. Uh, and so you know, re uh, you know, reweighting our distributions and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we can do that. Any other questions? All right. Thanks for coming. You know where my office is.